First of all, you're all welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have here uh, Dr. Vladimir Susha, who is the Director General of the Joint Research Centre uh, of the European Union, of the European Commission, rather, and uh, he's here to talk to us about what they're doing and looking into the future. So we're very grateful. And without any further ado, we can start. Uh, just to say the the, the, the uh, address by Dr. Sushar is on the record, but the discussion afterwards is under Chatham House Rules, which is that you can say what you like and it won't be attributed to you or to any organisation, but it can be, the information can be used. So that's it. Uh, to remind everybody, if you have a phone, to uh, either put it on silent or turn it off, and with that we can kick off. We hope to finish uh, in around two o'clock at least. And uh, that will be it. Okay? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, very happy <coughs> to be here, privileged. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll be telling you first maybe a few words about uh, uh, the organization which uh, uh, is uh, the European Commission Science and Knowledge Service called Joint Research Center, and uh, uh, I will probably start with introducing this organization uh, in a few words. So as, as the, the title says, we are scientific and knowledge service, so then our mission is to provide the cutting edge knowledge, scientific knowledge for policy making uh, of uh, the European Union in the uh, entire policy cycle. So then we are working at the beginning before uh, the legislation or policy is designed then we are accompanying uh, the commission in the process of negotiations the the, the process of uh, the legislative process in the european parliament and the council we are providing additional information and then we are actually working uh, uh, quite a lot and it represents 70 percent of our activities roughly we are working in implementation and in implementation, very often we are working with member states because you know that this is the, uh, then it's the, the, the role of member states to implement uh, uh, the, the legislation. So then we are working very often with uh, different national authorities, uh, uh, standardization bodies, uh, etc. In, in, in this respect, so we have uh, roughly 3,000 people. Uh, we have the headquarters in Brussels, uh, but that's the small uh, part of the of the uh, organization. And we have campuses uh, with the labs because we do a lot of laboratory work. We do the measurement. We provide the uh, you know, we, we provide different uh, um, standard reference materials. Actually, we are uh, together with US NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technologies. We are together the biggest producer of uh, reference materials in the world. So that very often, if you do uh, uh, some <coughs> analysis, uh, 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 this reference materials is coming from us, or it's coming from NIST in, in US. So then, uh, but we do it only in, in very complicated cases where there is no business model, because you know, the standard reference materials can be produced by private sector, mm -hmm. but in some cases, it's not, uh, it's not profitable. And it's, for example, in nuclear, nuclear security, nuclear safeguards. Nobody's interested because this is not a private, uh, uh, private good business. But we do it. Okay. So this is our uh, our uh, biggest advantage is that we are uh, independent on private, commercial, national interests. So then we very often do the arbitrage between different member states if they have different opinions on in implementation of something. And inside the Commission, obviously, we are not independent from the European Commission. And, uh, but within the Commission, our biggest asset is to be policy neutral. So then we are doing very often the arbitrage uh, within uh, different disputes, as you can imagine, the different policies, they have their own uh, interests. So then we are very often in the middle and trying to put this uh, debate uh, on based on the facts and the evidence which is available. So then we work very closely also with central services of European Commission, um, which are doing all this uh, 
decision making among the services, the prioritization, but also we are supporting uh, regulatory scrutiny board. I don't know if you know what it is. The regulatory scrutiny board is looking at every policy proposal uh, which is going to the College of Commissioners for decision and they are checking the facts, they are checking the robustness of the data, models, etc. And we actually uh, are providing them with, uh, with, uh, with the support because we are owners of uh, roughly um, uh, 100 uh, uh, economic, biophysical and, and nuclear models which you see there. We are also uh, having in those our campuses uh, some large-scale research infrastructure <coughs> which is now being open to all uh, users uh, from the EU because some of them, uh, they have uh, some spare capacity because they have been built a long time ago and we don't use them anymore. So then we have a lot of uh, temporary stuff uh, just to, to keep uh, the flexibility because the research question and focus is changing according to the priorities and the needs. So we also have a capacity of the fast response. So then. We have uh, we have very big capacity in uh, a disaster risk response. Actually, we are the biggest uh, knowledge hub uh, of Europe, but one of the biggest in the in the world uh, in um, in uh, uh, disaster risk uh, um, analysis and response. So then we are actually, if there is something happening where, wherever in the world, uh, disaster within. Uh, two to four hours, we are producing the first uh, assessment of the damage. So it's really fast track. So we are running for EU and for the world, the Copernicus uh, emergency system. So we know that Copernicus, I will be referring to it uh, for agriculture, uh, but uh, Copernicus is the best earth observation system in the world. It's, uh, it's the, the baby of the EU and, and a small part of it is for emergency. So then we are able to produce using this Copernicus emergency system the maps wherever it is needed uh, on the globe because we can use the, the images and, and the produce uh, this kind of stuff. Okay, so this is us. So then we are working with uh, 30 different commission departments, so it's really our expertise uh, ranges from nuclear safety, security safeguards to financial markets. Uh, um, so you mentioned uh, Olivier Gerson be being here. So DG FISMA, uh, the financial markets. So we are working very, very closely with them. And actually, you know, these bank guarantees and, and all this stuff, all this stuff uh, uh, that was calculated by my colleagues on the basis of our models, which we developed um, in, in this respect. So it's it's really very wide range uh, of. Uh, um, competencies which uh, used to be a uh, disadvantage because it was very difficult to communicate who we are and uh, what is our field of expertise. But now with this complex, um, wicked problem, problems and challenges of the society, I think this is a cutting edge uh, 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 advantage because it's uh, very rare to have uh, capacities uh, under one roof of uh, uh, such a diverse character. So then we are able to combine very unusual sets of skills within others if there is, if there is a need. Okay, good. So today, as, as it was announced, I'm going to talk about, uh, um, uh, about uh, agri-food uh, sector, what we have been doing together very closely with the Irish commissioner, actually, uh, Phil Hogan is the biggest ambassador of science for uh, agriculture and he is a very good ambassador <coughs> except of our commissioner, so then of, of our organization as well. I was, he visited us uh, several times, uh, he's always calling uh, for our expertise and it's amazing to work with him. He's very good, smart guy and I think that he's really moving common agricultural policy in, in, a, in a good direction. We are very happy uh, working with him. So uh, he was looking for different options and he was pushing his colleagues, but also us to, to look at what are the different technology options which are now uh, available uh, actually to uh, revolutionize or improve all this agri food sector. So then this is uh, going to tackle all those elements which are, which are uh, there. So it's producers. So what we may expect. 
So it's obviously this data revolution, I'm talking about that, uh, it's real revolution. It's not, because uh, very often people are saying, and, and my colleagues in the commission as well, you know, data, why you are so excited by the data? We have been always using the data and the official statistics has been established 150 years ago. What's, what's new? Uh, but that's a lot of, which is, which is going to, to change profoundly as, mm -hmm. as you may expect. So it's, it's this kind of uh, uh, different tools which uh, sensors uh, um, uh, collect, on, collect <coughs> of, of, of data which is going to uh, provide completely different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, opportunities. You know, in the policies and in agricultural policy we have all these seven year cycles. So then what usually was happening that there was some wishful thinking of policy maker or legislator at the beginning and then only after five or seven years, they were able to look back and to see, okay, it didn't work. So then let's try something else. So and then again, seven years. Uh, so what we are now trying to do is just to have uh, in-time uh, uh, monitoring of the performance of the policy. So then this data revolution is allowing us to monitor every farm, and I'll be coming to, to this in, in real time. So then. You don't need, if you need to correct your, and, and there is in the, in the middle, this is not a, a, not a, a, a sort of artificial, uh, artificial diagram. So this is what we have been testing in Lombardia, uh, uh, in Italy, with a uh, uh, large number, 15,000 of farms. So it's, it, this, is, this is a real-time monitoring of the performance uh, of uh, uh, of the, so it's obviously processors, those who are processing the food, distribution is going to be revolutionized. I, I've been uh, 10 days ago uh, to California and we had some meetings there and also I, I took uh, opportunity to visit a few companies uh, um, based on geospatial uh, data. And it's amazing what is, what is already on the market, uh, how they can predict uh, just by counting and recognizing the cars, number of cars in the parking slot before, uh, in, in front of the supermarket, they can, they can really make uh, the, the estimation of the profit, but also of the demand of the... Uh, 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 so it's, it's really amazing what is, uh, what, what is actually happening. So then even before uh, you go uh, to the supermarket, on the basis of data, they can predict what you are going to buy. Not on the personal individual basis, but you know, on the basis of analysis of the pattern of the data, of the behavior of the people in certain fields, in certain regions, they can perfectly predict what's going to be the level of consumption. So it, it's very important because as we have been saying, one of the problems of the food sector in the EU is, is food waste. And if we, if we want to reduce the footprint, uh, we have been talking about the climate, environmental footprint, so this is the best way. We should be cutting uh, of our, uh, our waste because it is, uh, it is something. So, okay, consumers, again, it, it's going to be really, really improvement for consumers because you can check what is the origin, what is the lifetime, uh, life cycle of every, every piece of uh, uh, of the food which you are, uh, which you are uh, doing. So, and obviously this is changing the life uh, of the farmer, it's changing the life of the, uh, of the agricultural sector because it is part of, um, of the big, uh, big uh, and complex, uh, uh, complex ecosystem uh, which one needs to take into account to avoid policy mistakes because you know, you remember if I mention one which is close to agriculture, the policy mistake uh, at the EU level uh, was the biofuel, uh, biofuel legislation. That, and this is because we totally ignored the complex, uh, uh, complex point of view. We have been looking at the climate issue, we have been looking very narrowly at the CO2 emissions and we said, okay, biofuels are great. No, uh, not very great because we didn't uh, uh, count in uh, the, the CO2 emissions of the plants. And we did not uh, take into account the increase of the price of the food, and we did not uh, take into account the fact that palm, uh, uh, the, the, the oil palms are going to be grown somewhere else outside EU. 
with with a big uh, big footprint, uh, and then this is even counterproductive. So okay, so this is what we need to, and that's why this complex system analysis is very important. That we are avoiding this uh, this kind of grave mistake. It's not only here, but it's everywhere. So then, this is going to be complex system analysis and modeling. And people talented in this field are going to be very, very demanded uh, species. So it's, it's going to be... Uh, so this is this Cambrian explosion of data. So you see uh, this uh, uh, exponential increase of the data. You see that we started uh, somewhere around 2009, 2010. So then somebody is saying uh, uh, that uh, all the data produced by all humanity until 2009 is being produced in 2019 within one day. So I don't know whether this is uh, true. It's anecdote. Uh, I don't think that it's possible to verify this, but it just shows that it is really probably I am usually using the comparison with uh, with, uh, uh, with the press, discovering of the press, uh, the, the printing and the Gutenberg revolution. And obviously, if you want to be gloomy, and the Gutenberg uh, discovery was followed by 30 years war. Uh, so because it was such a mm -hmm. profound change in the society, the society was unable uh, to cope with it. So then we need to make sure that the society is able to cope with this data revolution, which is, uh, which is now, now happening. Uh, obviously, um, there is one big challenge, uh, and uh, that's the challenge also for uh, agri-food sector, but it's in general for the data industry is energy consumption. Already now, the energy consumption is at the level of 8% uh, of the global energy uh, production. It's only for data centers and data processing. So then if somebody thinks that there is a way of uh, uh, centralizing the data, collecting the data, imagine that we will have these drones, uh, we will have these sensors on, on, the, on the tractors and everywhere, and this everything is going to be transferred to the big data centers, it's absolutely impossible. So we need to have something what we call edge computing or fog computing. So the, the processing of the data will be done at the edges uh, where they are produced. This the same applies for, uh, for autonomous cars, connected cars. We cannot, there is no time uh, to send the data to the data center and get uh, back uh, uh, some response. So all needs to be computed in the cars. Uh, everything needs to be computed in your smartphones or in the, when you have the sensors on the streets. Again, this should be computed and only the metadata is going to be somehow centralized. So it's very important uh, element. So this is uh, um, what, uh, what was our, uh, our research showing uh, what is the maturity and, and awareness of uh, uh, new technologies in, in the agriculture and what is actual adoption of this, uh, of this agriculture. You see that this green, uh, the, the green uh, histograms are awareness, they know, uh, but it's far from, uh, it's far from uh, being adopted uh, that, that well. So there is one ongoing project which we do some behavioral analysis, what would be the best approach, how to work with the farmers to let them help them to uh, actually adopt. And then we have the huge issue of cybersecurity, data security, and trust. So if we, if we want farmers to, to share their own data, they need to trust platform, they need to trust uh, provider. Uh, without data from, uh, from the farmers, we are not going to, to be able to provide all the services <coughs> and to, to uh, actually check the performance uh, but they are not going to, uh, they are not going to trust uh, uh, everybody. So that they really need to be uh, one element which is, uh, which is extremely important in this respect is to make sure that there is a transparency of what is happening with the data. Um, and that, that's also linked to one of our reports on artificial intelligence where we are proposing sort of a European third way of using artificial intelligence and data. Because you know that we have U.S. Uh, and it's it's a sort of laissez-faire. Let's uh, let's go as it as it goes, run by industry. Then you have uh, this Chinese way, 
uh, which is uh, uh, centralized uh, and it's, it's a more big brother type of uh, collection of data and, and watching people. So none of those seem to be um, uh, acceptable in Europe. So in Europe we have to develop something which will be of smaller scale uh, where you will have a traceability of what you are actually doing with the data and, and what is, there must be clear contract. I give you the data what I'm going to get uh, uh, in, sure. in, in, in response. So I think that this is, uh, this is very, very important from, uh, from that, that point of view, actually, I described this. Uh, so it's very difficult to convince a farmer to send the data to Yahoo and, uh, and you don't know what is happening with the data and you're not getting anything in return. Okay, so this is, uh, that was a, a video which I will show uh, um, at the end. Uh, we, we did a small uh, animation of uh, um, the, some anecdote about blockchain in a food, um, in, in a food chain, how this can be used. But let me uh, go straight to, it's not boring, you're still with me? Yeah. <laughs> it's not too long. Okay. okay, good. So I, I want to say what we are actually going to do or we are, what we are doing for common agricultural policy. Uh, you know, it's the biggest policy, it's very much criticized uh, very often, but actually it's the biggest success of the EU. Uh, and people, as, as we always, you know, we ignore that we, had, we have right now 70 years of peace, we take it for granted. Uh, and in the 50s, uh, there was a lot of uh, problems with the, with the food security. And actually, the, the common agricultural policy removed this totally. That, that, that this problem does not exist in Europe anymore. So I think this is thanks to, to this uh, common ag agricultural policy. OK, what we are going to do, uh, how this uh, is going to respond uh, to the new opportunities of the new technology. So this is what we have been doing, and actually it was the Joint Research Center working over the years, and you see that we have started um, uh, at the very beginning of 90s already to implement the cutting edge technology for agriculture and for common agricultural policy. So we are the most advanced uh, place on this planet in land parcel identification system, exactly thanks to early adoption of uh, satellite imagery in early 90s and it was very low quality but nevertheless it was possible to use it but there was a huge advancement uh, in in the meantime and now I will show you on this picture you see uh, 1990s so that was the roughly the quality 2000 and 2015 2015 the Copernicus is allowing us to have not only the visual pictures but to have a multispectral analysis of the field. So then we know everything what is happening in this field. And you see that the recognition is very strong. I, I didn't put the picture of, uh, of different seasons, but we have, uh, we have the picture of the same field taken every month. And then you can perfectly watch what is happening in the field. So then what actually is, is happening, you know, this error rate below 2%, that's the mantra of the Court of Auditors, because the, the, the Common Agricultural Policy is consuming half of the budget of the EU, so everybody is watching whether this is uh, consumed uh, properly. So that we cannot, we cannot uh, ignore, so it's very important. But what is uh, annoying for everybody, if somebody is watching you, uh, checking up on you, so that you have the audits and you have, an, and we have this uh, responsibility, and the duty to, to check physically 6% of uh, uh, the, the farms, the fields. And this is what we want to, to get rid of. Uh, so that hopefully with this technology, we will suppress all audits. Uh, uh, we are doing these audits, so then we are going to make our life a little bit more. We are not doing audits, it's DG Agriculture doing it, but we are doing all the work for them uh, based on satellite images. So this is exactly what, what, uh, we may, what we may get. And then we will be just looking at the performance and we will be informing in advance uh, the, the farmers uh, what, is, uh, what is going on in their field uh, because we will have all this information because right now the capacity is that we can monitor every farm, every field in Europe two to three times per week so that we can have a high resolution high quality images with all this multispectral analysis uh, at least twice a week.
so which gives you a fantastic opportunity okay so then this is what what we actually want to to do with uh, and this is obviously producing the big data that's why we are talking about big data the biggest problem is who is going to process the data who is going to provide the platform because we do not have a big players in europe as you know we do not have yahoo's google's google is perfectly able to do it but do we want google to uh, to do this do we want the Google to, uh, to collect the data and provide? No, we don't want, nobody wants this because we see that it's, uh, it's going a little bit over the top. So then this is the, the biggest problem. Hopefully there, there are few platforms which are emerging, which we, we are already now testing, but they are able to provide the, the access to the data uh, to all farmers and process the data which are going to be provided by, uh, by farmers. So then this is actually, what are what is uh, uh, what are those highlights? These reliable, modern, fair, simple, preventive, and performant. These are the highlights of the of the new common agricultural policy, which is enabled by uh, new technologies. And and we are working right now. And we have another year, <coughs> 2020. And we have six member states, and we are testing uh, this uh, methodology because. Uh, a uh, new cap will be uh, rolled out as of uh, January 2021. So then we need to be ready for 27, 8, I don't know, uh, countries uh, across the across EU. So then we are starting to work with uh, national authorities because that is uh, very important for, for payment. So this is actually what is going to happen. Uh, we will be asking uh, uh, the farmers just to send the pictures either picture from drone or from the smartphone, tagged, uh, um, processed pictures, which will be uh, sort of uh, um, compared with the, with the satellite imagery, and then we can, we can conclude on, on performance or fulfilling the criteria for payments. And because for payments, you need to have, uh, there are many criteria, and, and some of you, you might know it better than me, you need to have some green areas, you need to have some untouched areas, you need to have this and that, so and this is all uh, uh, possible to, to monitor uh, in real time. So this is just an example how these geotagged photos from farmers <coughs> will be done. So then you don't need to have audit, you don't need to have uh, national authorities going uh, and to check uh, up on you. So this is what, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, actually possible. So then this is the, the list of, uh, of all uh, all possibilities or, or supports which are going to be provided to farmers, timely tailored information to farmers, climate resilient, low emission practices and technologies which can be deployed, development of digital advisory system, um, the, the automation of processes, simplification, um, easy data capture solution, and uh, obviously the big, big issue is interoperability because every member state uh, has a slightly different approach. Every farmer or groupings of farmers will be using different devices. So then the big issue, uh, as always, is interoperability, but it is uh, uh, obviously solvable. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, the new common agricultural policy um, is aiming at, and you see there are this blue stuff is what EU is supposed to do, and uh, uh, this yellow uh, part is what member states are supposed to do uh, in, in this respect, and we are somewhere in the middle because we are working with the Commission uh, on this blue stuff, but we are also working with uh, uh, member states very closely. We have been uh, working with each and every uh, paying agency of the member states because this LPIS, this land parcel identification system, so then we have been helping uh, um, and working with them, and we are going to uh, to help them to implement uh, all these uh, all these needs, which are linked to uh, to uh, the new uh, measures and the uh, and the adoption of the new new technologies. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the overview of uh, of the conclusions. What what I mentioned. I don't think that I need to repeat it. Uh, it's going to be a revolution. I think it's going to be a very positive uh, revolution. I hope that all testing, uh, piloting this year and next year is going to uh, bring positive results. We have a lot of positive results. And, uh, well, I hope that uh, uh, once again, agriculture will be ahead of everybody and it will be huge, huge sector 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, which will be early adopter of the advanced technologies so to improve the life of, uh, of the farmers, improve the quality of their products for, for the use of, uh, of everybody. So if you're still uh, alive, and uh, uh, I will try to... Uh, uh, Hello, I thought I'd tell you about all the attention I get from blockchain, which monitors my daily movements. My friends and I love blockchain's new shared network. Oh, it's a bit like being on social media. A tomato knows how tough it can be to gain trust. Once you're with the blockchain crowd, it's easy to mingle. We tomatoes also like to feel that our data is safe. Blockchain tightens the lid, increasing that security. And it has a data validation protocol that guarantees a system virtually impregnable to any naughty business. The peer-to-peer -peer network decentralizes and streamlines the process by eliminating intermediaries. Blockchain's culture of transparency allows you to see right through us, so we've absolutely nothing to hide. And the data from all our transactions is locked. No one can delete or modify it, even if they want. Where we grow and wherever we decide to travel within the food supply chain, you can easily trace us. You could even see on which farm I was grown, what I was fed and where I was processed before landing on your supermarket shelves. Blockchain enables the identification of safety breaches, shielding consumers from potential hazards. Instant access to data, such as on trade volumes or delivery times, provides clients with greater market transparency. Smart contracts enable transactions to be automatically activated by your preset instructions. Blockchain streamlines the management of the supply chain by eliminating useless intermediaries. Uniting the physical and the digital food worlds is one of the many key challenges that blockchain or any other digital technologies used for this purpose currently faces. Blockchain is a young technology, not yet fully delivering in terms of performance or scaling up capacity. Use cases need to be developed to decide best architecture options and security measures. Blockchain offers significant improvements in the agri-food sector that merits being explored thoroughly. Thank you. Very good.